It's a tremendous pleasure and honor to be here uh, this week, uh, particularly with uh, the installation of uh, uh, Father Chris. Uh, and uh, just this whole topic is really close to my heart. It's something I've written on uh, and a lot in the past couple of years. Uh, and so uh, just to be able to come and talk about it. Um, so uh, it, the world is so small. Uh, I, that uh, I ran across an article uh, last year or so in uh, the wonderful little journal uh, Road to Emmaus and was wonderful interviews uh, with Dr. Petitsis and uh, that I was just completely taken with. But I had an obscure question out of the articles about Maximus the Confessor and so I just picked up the phone and called him uh, to ask him for a reference. And, but I called him and I told him who it was and he said, oh, are you related to the marvelous Ali Freeman, <laughs> which is a niece of mine in Washington, D.C., and I thought, this is, this is orthodoxy. The world's so small, um, and she's not even orthodox, but uh, there you go. Um, the world is small, but uh, it's a joy to be here. Uh, your eminences, your graces, my uh, brother clergy, my sisters and brother in Christ, glory to Jesus Christ, glory, glory forever. Writing in the 1970s, Father Alexander Schmemann described secularism as, he said, the greatest heresy of our time. His definition of secularism was of a worldview that holds that there is such a thing as a neutral zone, a sphere of life that has nothing necessarily to do with God. It's not at all the denial of the existence of God, uh, not as Schmemann treated it, uh, though many uh, who would call themselves secularists do deny an existence of God, but it's rather the contention that if God exists, he is somehow removed from the day-to-day -day existence of all things. In summary, if God exists, then he should know his place and stay there. Um, it's surprising how this is spreading. I, I got in trouble a few years ago. I was in a Target uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, I mean, and this is Bible Belt. Uh, in fact, Knoxville, Tennessee, according to some survey, was the most Bible-believing town in America. So, you know, you've got to take this in consideration, but I'm in Target and a lady sneezes, and I said, God bless you. And she chewed me out, <laughs> apparently for introducing God into Target. Of course, um, <laughs> you know, it would lower prices, but, um, <laughs> But now, mind you, Father Alexander said that secularism was a heresy. This is not simply saying that it's wrong and we disagree with it. Many things are wrong that are not heresies. And Father Alexander was not someone to throw that word around lightly, unlike the internet, uh, where everything is a heresy if I didn't write it kind of thing. But um, he said it was a heresy. And indeed, I would contend that it is held by most Christians in America. It is, it is wrong, but it is believed by most Christians in America, including many Orthodox. To be born in America is, in fact, I believe, to be born into a world in which the dominant form of thought, the phronema, since I'm up here, um, the phronema is secularism. Only a concerted, intentional effort can give us anything like a non-secular worldview. But I agree with Father Schmemann. The secularism is the greatest heresy of our time, and as such, it's also the greatest danger, our greatest challenge, and the one dangerous challenge that we dare not ignore. Speaking to secular America is therefore the single greatest mission work of our generation and this time and this place. Um, and I hope when we have uh, finished the talk tonight that you will understand that differently than you did before you heard this talk. That why secularism is a danger and a challenge uh, is, has nothing to do with politics. In fact, secularism is not particularly political at all. I have given this talk the title, The God You Don't Believe In. At the very root of secularism is a God who differs dramatically from the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ as proclaimed in the scriptures and received by the church. Tonight, 
I want to look first at this God in whom we do not believe, as Orthodox Christians, that is, the secular God. Secondly, I want to look at a few key assumptions of secular culture that are hallmarks of its American expression. And finally, I'll look at some particular things that must be said in speaking the Christian God in this time and place. The task of speaking to secular America does not entail changing anything about the teaching of the church. However, it requires being deeply aware of context and the true character of the culture in which we live. I've discovered that being mindful of this stuff, there's a lot of times I get in a conversation that someone says something and I can't say it. I just, I think, no, 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 that, I don't believe that. That's not the case. And so hopefully this should mess you up. Um, <laughs> we must learn with care not to offer a secular orthodoxy. It's fairly striking that the existence of God actually gets as much attention as it does in our world. The nuns are very interested in the topic of God. Uh, just, you know, I write it, if I write an article uh, on my blog that plugs uh, issues with atheists, I just, I get lots, of, and I do that occasionally just to bump the views. Um, you know. <laughs> It's good for press. Um, yeah, anyway, but some of this has to do with the so-called culture wars, but much of it is simply a popular conversation. I've had many uh, very intentional engagements with atheist or deeply skeptical agnostics in the course of writing and commenting. Most of the time, I have to begin the conversation by saying, tell me about the God you don't believe in. I probably don't believe in that one either. Yeah. Uh, the conversation that follows often speaks volumes. I've often thought that there are Catholic atheists, Protestant atheists, Sunday school atheists, lots of Sunday school atheists, as I don't believe in the God my you know, Aunt Tilly taught me in Sunday school, uh, angry atheists, and sometimes Orthodox atheists. I'll do an aside that's not in my script. I came to faith in Jesus Christ through icons in the Baptist church. Isn't that great? As a child, I, I went to uh, a little program that was called uh, Sunbeams, and it's in Southern Baptist Church in South Carolina, and a little lady, Miss Dempsey, had the class. Now, every Sunday in church, the preacher yelled at us, and it was hellfire and brimstone and the angry, vicious God, all of that sort of stuff that apparently just went right over me. And but Mrs. Dempsey had me in her class, and in the class they had pictures that had been published by the Broadman Press in Nashville, and uh, the pictures were like Jesus the Good Shepherd and things like that, and Mrs. Dempsey taught us songs like, Jesus wants me for a sunbeam. He's so sweet. And that's the Jesus I came to believe in as a child, and I never got along with the other one. So the God I do believe in, and I still believe in, is the sunbeam Jesus. Uh, <laughs> in my little Baptist Sunday school. Um, I just finally had to become Orthodox to find him, but um, he was obscured in many places. Um, there are angry atheists, sometimes even Orthodox atheists, but on most occasions, the God who is the object of unbelief is just a caricature. Well-known neo-atheists like Christopher Hitchens are successful primarily in their ability to portray a straw God, not the real God or anything we, you and I would even talk about. Uh, it's just a God imagined by a culture that is increasingly marked by ignorance and misinformation. I mean, you have to remember, there's people out there who actually get their historical information from Discovery Channel, you know, or Time Magazine. It just, I mean, the level of cultural ignorance is if you think there's religious ignorance, there's historical ignorance, abysmal historical ignorance. We're, um, it's a very difficult, crazy time we live in. Um, but who is this secular God? In 2005, Albert Muller Jr. published his work, Moralistic Therapeutic Deism, The New American Religion, which was an analysis based on surveys of 3,000 teens, which are one of the great theological repositories of America. But um, <laughs> It's become a very popular read, frankly, because it's accurate. You read it and you think, I know lots of people who believe this. I hear the undertones of his analysis repeatedly in popular conversations about God, and Muller noted five primary aspects of this dominant cultural version of Christianity. One, a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life 
on earth. Mind you, that's different than saying he interacts with it all the time and him, we live and move and have our being. He just watches. God wants people, the second one, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. Three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. Five, good people go to heaven when they die. It's pretty generic and it, it, it works. First, we're told that there is a God, and this speaks volumes. Oftentimes, the secular God is at best a lightly Christianized version of a pagan deity. He is a supreme being. God is not a supreme being. God is not a anything. Now, this is just basic understanding of the fathers. Is St. Gregory the Theologian says, in as much as he exists, we don't exist, and as much as we exist, he doesn't exist. Even the word being has a different meaning when we speak it of God. Does he exist? Yes, but what does that mean? Something that I can't speak. Something that is the ground of my existence. But this is a God, big guy. This God is mostly like us, only nicer, bigger, and more powerful. The supreme being among many other beings. The secular God is someone you can have a conversation about, but he is not the God before whom all conversation must cease. He does not inspire awe. He does not create wonder. He is trapped in the imagination of a culture with a mind as wide as a TV screen and just as deep. <laughs> I had an opportunity a few years back to spend some time with a young man who was somewhere in his 30s he was at a critical moment in his life. He had been in treatment for alcohol and drug addiction. I volunteer once a week in a, in a treatment center. But as is typical in treatment situations based on the 12 steps, the question of God or a higher power uh, came up. It's very important. You want to get sober. He had been raised in a secular family. His father was a scientist out at the lab uh, in Oak Ridge where I live. He had no church exposure at all, but his life stood in great need. And we had built up a good relationship. And uh, so in our conversation, it was not an argument, but in our conversation, I was looking for common ground. And so I began with the Big Bang. I like the Big Bang. I believe in the Big Bang, unless they prove it didn't happen. And then I won't believe in the Big Bang, but for right now, I like the Big Bang. Um, it makes sense and it squares with my reading of Genesis. So anyway, I brought up the Big Bang and I see, and I said to him, what was there before the Big Bang? And he said, I don't know. Yes, I agreed, that's the God I believe in. Not the God that I know, but the God that I don't know. As an Orthodox Christian, I believe that Christ makes known the God whom we absolutely could not know otherwise. All that I know of God I know through Christ. No one has seen the Father except the Son, to whomsoever the Son makes him known. And it was interesting. It was a fruitful beginning. He didn't become a Christian out of it, but he could work with a God he didn't know. It became his higher power. And uh, last time we talked, he was making progress and was still sober. Uh, the God I don't know. It's interesting because in AA they talk about it as the God of your understanding and I always, you know, I say I don't know about the God of my understanding. I don't have one of those. But uh, the second element in this secularized faith, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. And that's not entirely wrong. Um, I've tried to explain that to children over the years. It is, however, easily nothing more than code language for simply a bourgeois ethic. God wants people to behave like nice middle-class white people, <laughs> meaning my people. What is lacking in this is any account of suffering or any suggestion of why people should suffer willingly. And I'll come back to this later. Suffice it to say for the moment that there is no ethic in Christianity that is not a suffering ethic. We have no such faith. We have no such faith. The third point is tragically true for the secular world. The secular world believes that the purpose of life 
is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. This is actually just another way of saying that consumerism has become a form of spirituality in our secular culture. Being happy and feeling good is what shopping is for. I know people who go shopping for therapy. You know, well, I have. Um, you know, if your card's good and you're just kind of feeling bummed out, kind of go to the mall, buy a thing or two, you know. Heck, buying a new car can do you for months. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm st I bought my wife a car last year and I still feel good about it. I really do. <laughs> Every time I drive it. But, <laughs> but this is deformation of the truth of our humanity into its lowest form. I consume. So does an earthworm. <laughs> you know? And he even consumes much more rationally than I do. You know? If you're not orthodox in America, then it's highly unlikely that the way you worship looks at all like the way your grandparents worshiped just two generations ago. Church, both in doctrine and worship, itself has become subject to fashion and fad, a never-ceasing search for what sells. I spoke recently at a uh, nearby evangelical college in Tennessee, and it's my second time to go there, but the, 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 the convocation for the whole campus was about a thousand students begins with rock and roll church. You know, we got the things up there, like, you know, with the words singing. They had a really fantastic rock band. I mean, they were good. And a a light panel. I mean, he was so sophisticated. It was amazing. Uh, it's not unusual for an evangelical church to have dropped one to three million bucks in their lighting and sound system. I mean, the mega churches. And uh, I was really impressed with it. It's, you know, but it's sort of strange, um, to say the least. And it's a very odd place to speak, um, but uh, they keep asking me back. Uh, oh, no. But the fastest growing churches in our culture are these mega churches. They're also the least identifiable churches, as we heard this morning. Uh, it's become the standard marketing practice to obscure the denominational identification and the churchiness of churches. I had some Romanians in our parish who visited in a large uh, Presbyterian megachurch in Knoxville, and they came back and they said it was very strange. Father Stephen said it uh, felt like the foyer was like our living room. And I thought, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. And the rest is like your theater. Um, but behind all of this is the marketing of Christianity. It's not the preaching of the gospel, but the marketing of a product. And we must be clear about this. Not only can we not compete, we should not even be in the game. It is slowly destroying the soul of our culture. Consumerism is. Christianity as consumerism is indeed a heresy. It appeals to something wrong in human beings. In fact, in the night, you can trace back the development of consumer Christianity of the 19th century and the great revival movements, especially the Second Great Awakening, the Cane Break Awakening in Kentucky and some other places. These are the roots of, of especially of, of evangelicalism and later Southern evangelicalism that really didn't start until after the Civil War. These began before, but um, it was uh, the the great theoretician of uh, the Second Great Awakening, whose name's escaping me at the moment, I've left my manuscript, um, but his, he had a theory that said God is always, always willing to do revival, okay? That is, revival is God's will always and everywhere, and therefore, any technique required to get you there is good. And historically, I don't make this stuff up, historically, the roots of modern advertising are found right there. Uh, you have no idea the historical importance of these, these great evangelical awakenings in America. They are the roots of feminism. They are the roots of prohibition. They are the roots of the social gospel. They are the roots of uh, most of what we think of politically in our country. The, 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 the history of the 20th century in America can not be understood unless you know the religious history of the 19th century. Very, very important. Um, so this is, some of this stuff is not new, it's just bearing fruit, uh, strange fruit. 
The fourth point that God does not need to be particularly involved in daily life except when you need him is what I call the God of the neutral zone. I think the underlying drive for this aspect of our secularism, perhaps underlying the whole of secularism, is a certain perceived version of freedom. I'll come back to this, but I want to say at the moment that the presence of God at all times and in all places is seen as cramping our style. Well, God gets in our way. For instance, I'm an advocate of wearing cassocks. Uh, I was an Anglican, so I wore a collar, and I needed to change when I became Orthodox because I was staying in the same town. Archbishop Dimitri said, would you stay and start an English-speaking mission? And I thought, well, as long as I can wear the dress. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, but I know from experience that the ante is raised considerably when a cassock appears in public over what it is with a collar. Collars are bothersome, but cassocks are really bothersome. It's the invasion of the secular normal neutral space with something and someone who is decidedly involved with God. It would be better if perhaps they found out you were like a Hare Krishna or something and that would be okay. But this Christian thing, this is bothersome. Um, it is a sacramental presence and priesthood is certainly meant to be a sacrament and not just at the altar. Um, Priests who are clearly identified as priests um, have an impact of, in the world around them. I've been yelled at, cursed, flipped off by a cabbie on the streets of London, yeah. um, ridiculed for being a Jew. I like that one. That one's really odd. <laughs> and I think, you know, I would grab my cross and go, hey, hey, hey. But, um, well, in the South, I mean, they'd never seen a cassock anyway, and they're just looking, are you a Jew? And I'm thinking, no, I don't have horns. Um, see, I mean, what? What is wrong with these people? I told you, they know no history. They know no history. They haven't seen me on the History Channel yet. But I've also taken lots of prayer requests. Strangers come up to me in a Burger King. I, I go a lot to Waffle House in Oak Ridge. I know everybody there. They call me Father Stephen and walk in the door. I say, I'll have my usual, and I get prayer requests and things from them. And, you know, I'm a priest in Waffle House, and it becomes my chapel. You know? I've counseled with people in Walmart because uh, they can see what I am. And not all of them. That's also the places where I've been yelled at and called a Jew. But, you know, but also I'm a priest in Walmart. Uh, and it ceases to be a secular place. God has invaded Walmart. Um, if there is a lingering concern within orthodoxy that somehow we need to fit in, I know this was a concern earlier in the 20th century at a certain point, it's sort of an immigrant issue, uh, we need to get over fitting in. This is not a culture you want to fit in. They don't need us to fit in. They've got plenty of people fit already. They need something that doesn't fit in for the right reasons. You can't be it if you can't see it, to quote Jesse Jackson. Um, he and I are from the same hometown, actually. The non-sacramental aspect of the world takes me to our second major focus in this talk, the nature and character of secular America. Secular America is simply another name for the modern project, as scholars call it. The modern project, which uh, is a set of ideas and assumptions set in place in the late 1700s that were uh, part of the program of the Enlightenment and became applied to culture. Uh, moralistic, therapeutic deism that I cited did not spring into existence from nowhere. It's not been a specific teaching of any religious leader. It's a culture phenomenon. And it is to the culture that we have to look in order to understand it. And I remind you that we Orthodox are not immune to the culture in which we live. Uh, the teens polled who gave rise to the moralistic therapeutic deism analysis could easily have, been, uh, have contained Orthodox youth and in some places could have just been all Orthodox youth. It would be what they described to you. But what is it about our culture that produces such a skewed take on religious believing? There are several I key ideas that are inherent part of the modern project, the secular project, that should draw our attention. First, there's an assumption that human beings are autonomous centers of consciousness. That is, that we exist primarily as individuals, and the strongest and most important aspect of that consciousness is that we choose. Free will. That we choose. We are autonomous centers of consciousness, 
who choose, and our choices, we think, themselves create our authentic existence. We are, we are what we choose to be. And if this is the true state of being human, then the single most important aspect of the culture would be freedom. For only if we are free without social restraint, only if we are free can we choose what is our own authentic existence. I hope some of this is ringing bells for you and maybe even sounds normal because it is what is normal in America. We think these things. It becomes a slogan of all kinds of stuff. Be all that you can be. You know, my mother told me you can be anything you want to be. It was not true. Please note that this understanding is decidedly anti-traditional. It was anti-traditional when it began in the late 1700s. It's anti-traditional today. In the modern project, our secular world, human beings do not see themselves as products of a culture. Everything that is ours at birth, we think, has the potential to stand in the way of what I want and what I choose. And if the goal of life is to be happy, then the practice of that goal is getting what I want and what I choose. If being orthodox gets in the way of that, it's the American way. You know, I'm going to choose something else. I had an interesting experience a few years back. I have a Russian woman in my congregation who had grown up during the Soviet period in Russia and immigrated to Tennessee. She and her family were completely unchurched. Unchurched. No churching in them at all. In fact, her husband said, I don't even know what prayer sounds like. I thought it was an interesting thing, way to say it. I don't know what prayer sounds like. Um, I catechized her and her family uh, and baptized them and their two children. And several years after her baptism, uh, in a conversation, I made an offhanded comment in which I referred to her as a convert. And she bristled uh, and immediately told me, I am not a convert. She said, converts are people who choose. And she said the word choose with a certain loathing I have never heard. No Americans that I've ever known would boast that the most important thing in their life was not a choice. To the American ear, choosing to be orthodox is obviously superior to simply being born that way. My parishioner made it clear to me, Ya pravoslavni. <laughs> I did not choose. I'm orthodox. I just hadn't been baptized, she said. Well, this same love of freedom that we have and the perceived choices that it affords is perhaps America's most cherished notion. The fathers of the Enlightenment held that there was, in fact, no such thing as a fixed human nature. You get to pick one. Pick your own. Listen to this quote. At the heart of liberty, is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and the mystery of human life. That's Justice Kennedy in the 1992 decision in Casey versus Planned Parenthood. The heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and the mystery of human life. Of course, it's very inconvenient if my concept and definition means you get to die. But so it is. That's America we choose. It's actually among the most radical assertions of individual liberty ever put forward, and it clearly resonates within our culture. The fathers of the Enlightenment were radicals, but I don't think they were nearly as radical as our modern individualism, as our modern mainstream. Of course, we're not actually free to choose very much. That's the truth of things. I have this conversation with young people all the time. So I remember when I was 20, I thought I, had, I, I could choose everything. I made some choices. Um, but we're not really free to choose very much because there actually is such a thing as a fixed human nature. And it's a dogma of our faith. There really is a human nature. Our existence is gifted to us. We are all the product of a tradition. Everybody, the most hard-hearted atheist ever born, was traditioned into existence. 
I'm a white Southern Anglo-Saxon Appalachian. I speak English like a native. <laughs> I can't be anything else. I'll never be a Greek. I'll never be a Russian. I'll never be a Native American or a woman. Most of what makes me who I am did not come as a result of choice. It came as a result of the giftedness of existence. Under the influence of my Russian parishioner, though, I've learned to say that I am not a convert. I simply lived in schism for myself for 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> then I came to my senses. But so what is the choice that so drives our culture? Essentially, it's the choice that we call consumerism. The primary choices that people make are exercised when they shop, and th though shopping does not actually establish our authentic autonomous existence, we tend to think it does. In the South, for instance, I don't know about y'all up here, but in the South we are extremely tribal. But we get to choose our own tribes. The tribes we inhabit are things like bulldogs, wolf packs, tigers, volunteers, and gamecocks. Um, in a roll tide, but don't even know what that is. But uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, on the Friday before game day, everywhere you go, the tribal colors are out for full display. Everybody wears orange. Most workplaces encourage. I mean, it's like, it's, you go to work, you can wear just the most garish orange thing you want to. It's good in Knoxville. In fact, you'll feel funny if you don't. I have not bought an orange cassock. <laughs> But if I'm going to be effective in Walmart, I probably should. But anyway, they, uh, these are tribal colors. Most workplaces have them. There are brave folks who like to live dangerously and actually wear an Alabama hat or a Florida t-shirt. And they're taking their own life in their hands. But when I read the Orthodox internet, it often has the same tribal markings. People celebrate their choices. I love this. Orthodox, Christian, only tougher. I mean, these are by people who read about fasting. <laughs> they have the book. Right? Anyway, uh, what is being proclaimed is the, I shopped for my religion and found the best one certainly better than yours. And in this, we are secularists, right down to our tribal religions. I've often told people who come to me, and my, my parish is 75% convert, but I tell people, you know, why should you be orthodox? It's because you can't do anything else. You know, because you recognize in this, you are coming home. I, I say it jokingly that I was in schism for myself for 45 years, but I was. I was. And sometimes it was very not pretty. But you can hear the echoes of Kennedy, the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. We cannot speak to secular America by simply presenting ourselves as one more choice for the religious consumer. Just old, improved, reliable Christianity, or something like that. As deeply un-American as it may sound, we must speak to the issue of freedom itself and to the true nature of what it means to be human. What is happening in secular America is the dehumanization of a population. It's not just about the church. To follow Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully man, he's the first fully man. I tell people, for I can make you orthodox, I've got to make you human. Becoming orthodox is the path towards our true humanity. What the tradition remembers is how to be human. I, this is a, an aside, not in the manuscript, but I got to tell you this one. My favorite example of tradition in human beings is breastfeeding. Uh, in 1980, our first daughter was born, and uh, my wife was sort of avant-garde, and she said she wanted to breastfeed that baby. And, uh, you know, and it was, we, it was kind of California or something and so we came back to South Carolina my mama had not breastfed and her mother had not breastfed because the doctor said we now know better and you need to use this formula how do you know how much that baby's getting when you're nursing them you know things like that and so neither mom had nursed when our first baby was born she was born a little early and her nursing reflex wasn't developed yet and so she wasn't going to nurse right and my wife was unhappy the baby was unhappy which means I was seriously unhappy and <laughs> 
And it was not going to be any happy until this thing was solved. And I thought, what can you do? They did not, you young people, they didn't have lactation specialists on doctor staffs back then. You know, it was like, you know, you almost had to go to a witch doctor to find out about nursing. But my wife found a couple of ladies who belonged to a thing called the Leche League. They were Catholics and, and they were all keep, they were interested in, you know, breastfeeding and they came over to my house and spent eight hours with my wife and my daughter and, you know, who's like a week old. And at the end of the day, she nursed. And I thought, that's really cool. You can taught an eight, you taught a seven day old baby how to do something. I was deeply impressed. Um, and, you know, and my life had returned to happy and it was all good. But Think about this. We are mammals. <laughs> what is it about mammal that doctors didn't understand? That you want to tell a mammal don't nurse? I mean, that's crazy. You might choose not to nurse. There's even occasionally medical reasons not to, but frankly, you're built for it. We're made to do it. We belong to a whole group of animals from the whales and all over. We nurse our babies. I don't know how they do that under the ocean. But, <laughs> you know, but, you know, but we live in, you know, what is secular America? It's crazy. It thinks of things that have, I mean, it will tell you to do stuff that's just not human and tell you that science now knows. Well, I'm sorry, they don't now know. Any number of villages in Africa could have solved my wife and baby's problem. You know, every woman there would have known what to do, would have had her fixed up. You know, there's a science of being human that's as old as humans. And it's tradition. Nothing wrong with the other stuff. But being a human being is a gift. It's handed down to us. And as deeply un-American as it sounds, we have to speak to this issue of freedom. Because in truth, pretty much the whole of who we are is a gift. Most aspects of our personality are set long before we have made any choices. We are born into a culture, a language, a family. Our DNA contains a record of the whole of humanity stretching back to before we were something that might even be called human. I don't want to offend any of you, but anyway, that's what I think. And I am my ancestors. Their DNA is in me. I am my ancestors. Often ignored is the statement in the book of Hebrews. I thought I bought some Bible for this. That, uh, we're told that Levi gave tithes to Melchizedek because he was still in the loins of his father Abraham. Okay? It's a DNA. And spiritually true, too. We are not autonomous. We are deeply and profoundly interconnected. St. Siloan said, my brother is my life. You are my life and I am yours. The modern secular world often views the givenness of our existence as a curse. It's an obstacle to be overcome, to be modified more to our liking. We discovered that we can't bear our gender and make no mistake, that's a difficult problem for some folks. But we don't like the shape of our face. I looked it up the other day. We spend $12 billion a year on cosmetic surgery, not to fix the broken nose that you got in the fight, but just because you don't like how you look. Twelve billion dollars in America alone. The modern secular world views our existence often as a curse. We need poutier lips, a smaller chin, larger breasts, want hair on our head. Whatever it is, we want what has not been given to us, and so we enter into a new phase of human existence. I read a recent article by Mark Schiffman, who's Associate Professor of Classical Studies at Villanova, on what he described as transhumanism. It's an article in, in uh, uh, First Things recently. Uh, and he said, it's the project that many imagine for our future in which we overcome our biological limits through various technologies and manipulations. It's not science fiction. It's already becoming part of our reality. Uh, marriage and family in America could not exist in its present form without technological intervention mostly in terms of birth control, you know. But, and I'm not saying don't practice any birth control, but I'm telling you, it's kind of weird that as human beings, we need technology to keep from being what we are. What is that, you know? How do you talk about marriage as union when you've got people who think sex is just fun, 
You know, I, I tell the young people at my church, you should, when you think, don't say that you had sex with someone, say you made a baby. Say I was trying to make a baby. And if you, you know, and always talk about it like that. We tried to make, it because then they'll begin to understand what it's about. That's what that's for. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's what the parts are designed for. They happen to be fun because God's a good God and he loves mankind. <laughs> but we know what they're for. And when we quit living like that, we cease to be truly human. We begin to diminish ourselves. But Schiffman, writing in his article, cites a fellow, Steve Fuller, who teaches at Warwick University in um, England, who's coined uh, the project that he calls Humanity 2.0. According, and this is Schiffman I'm quoting, according to Fuller, this agenda is driven by the same inspiration that is the source of all religion. This is the human capacity for self-transcendence, which he identifies as the foundation of our human dignity. The foundation of my human dignity is not being what I am. I think that's what he really means by self-transcendence. I become cuckoo I'm the walrus, but anyway. Um, he says, science enables us to know dimensions of reality that we will never experience with our bodily senses. I heard that in the 1960s. <laughs> yes, better living through modern chemistry. But uh, from the hidden world of cells to distant black holes, it provides an infinity of applications that extend our powers beyond the limits of the biologically given bodies of old-fashioned humanity 1.0. Science is thus the highest fulfillment of what makes us human. God, help us this man's teaching. He's teaching, and he's not alone. Back to my text, what's here described as self-transcendence is simply the application of radical freedom and high technology to the givenness of human existence. I also like to think it's really kind of interesting that people are worried about doing that sort of stuff, and we got people who can't even have clean water and eat and die of starvation. Here's some guy in England wanting to talk about self-transcendence. Why don't we transcend greed? Forgive me. You can elect me next week. But um, I get a whole new me. C.S. Lewis in various essays in at least two novels confronted this strange modern drive to completely obscure nature. He called it the abolition of man. He also embodied it in character and a character that was called the Unman in his Paralandra novel. He saw in the mid-1940s what would have seemed unimaginable to most people at the time, but Lewis was a deeply astute reader of the age, a profound Christian thinker, and frankly, he just did the math and extrapolated, and it's coming true now. His spiritual tutor, George MacDonald, gives voice to this demand for self-transcendence um, in a voice that's reminiscent of Milton's Paradise Lost. It's from his book, Lilith, who's an amazingly interesting character in MacDonald. Um, but she's stuck in hell, sort of. She says, so long as I feel myself, what it pleases me to think myself, I care not. I am content to be to, be to myself what I would be. What I choose to seem to myself makes me what I am. My own thought makes me me. My own thought of myself is me. Another shall not make me. This is a demonic voice. Tradition is neither a style nor an option in the consumer house of philosophy. I sometimes shudder when I hear someone say, I'm a traditionalist. For many, traditionalist just means they like old stuff. Many old things are not properly part of tradition with a capital T. Indeed, in America, things that are described as traditional are often not very old. They're just simply antiquated versions of secular modernity. Tradition, rightly understood, is what is given to us. It is paradisus. It is first and foremost life and existence itself. For thou it was who brought us out of non-existence into being, St. John Chrysostom says. And the tradition is not given to me out of thin air. It's handed down to me first from my parents, 
honor your mother and father that your days may be long in the land. What is given to me is my humanity, and my humanity is not a creation of my own. It's not a choice of my own. It's not some so-called act of trans transcendence. It is profoundly a gift. The life that is rightly lived turns in wonder and awe towards the gift and allows it to unfold. There's an essential aspect of the giftedness of our life, an essential spiritual attitude, and that attitude, seems obvious, is thanksgiving. We cannot and do not give thanks for what has not been given to us, and yet we are commanded to give thanks always for all things. And the corollary is, everything is a gift. Everything is a gift. We are created to be Eucharistic beings. Again, Father Alexander Schmemann says this very clear. Homo Eucharisticus. We are the ones who give thanks. We are the priests of the world who unite our voice with the groanings of all creation in praise to the author of our being and our God. Tradition, that which has been given to us, is not some theological position among others, traditionalism versus some other ism. Tradition and the life lived with right regard for it is just a human life. It's the same life that sees the world itself as a gift and cares for it with thanksgiving and kindness. The world has not been given to us as the arena for our technology. It's been given to us as the place we live. In many ways, the modern drive to transcend the givenness of the world has been an engine of alienation. We've become strangers to the planet where we live, and it shows. We live like we're not going to stay here long. And as we speak to this alienation, the false existence of the secular world, there are things we need to understand. I tend to have a lot of trouble with this point, not in writing it, but in getting people to understand it and see the truth of it. So I'm going to give a run at it here. We're, we're not far from the end. Y'all just hang on. Um, but <clears throat> this is it. We are not making the world into a better place. That is one of the secular uh, maxims of the world, but we are not making the world into a better place. Not only we are not making the world into a better place, we have never been commanded by God to make the world into a better place. There is no such commandment, but modernity and the secular world hold this to be an absolute essential of their creed. It's hidden within the belief that the purpose of life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself, and so I need to make the world a place where I can be happy and feel good. That's progress. The deepest corners of the modern heart, there's a belief that the world is in fact improving and that even if things in my life are bad now, with a little work, they can be better. Try harder. Progress and improvement are the mantras of our lives. Our politics are utterly married to the proposition of progress. Our economy is built on the assumptions of progress, even if it's unsustainable. And they're wrong. Please understand, I'm not saying that things don't change. Obviously things change. Heraclitus said it. Pantare, all things change. But progress is not about change. It's a narrative about the direction of change. I'll be 62 in about another week. I've seen a lot of change in my life, a lot of it in the mirror. I have the stories of my parents and my grandparents and our collective memory I think back to my grandmother's stories. It goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. In our collective memory, the world has undergone an amazing amount of changes. But I do not believe we have made progress. Things are different. We are not evolving towards a better future. I will live longer, probably, although I'd like to live as long as my grandfather. I'll probably outlive my grandmother. You can make a careful selection of certain criteria to make a case for progress, but an equally valid case can be made for its absence by choosing a different set of criteria. But the most essential category has remained the same. People are no different. There is no moral progress because, first off, you're not standing on the shoulders of someone who became morally good and now you get to be morally better. It's kind of, they can hand on something to you and hopefully over some years they'll form character. But, you know, we're not making moral progress. But there's ways people like to tell the story that we're making moral progress. You can, but we're not becoming better people. I've heard confessions now for 35 years, first as an Anglican 
and now as an Orthodox priest, and they sound the same. And I dare say they would have sounded similar 100 years ago with a little less technology. Uh, but just because we have cell phones and the internet does not mean that we have ourselves changed. Think of what people do with the internet. It's not progress. What has changed over the past three centuries has been the rising of a cult of change, a belief in progress as the purpose of our existence, and in the name of progress, we fail to actually live. And it is to the point of actually living that I want to draw our attention as I close tonight. What's the proper nature of our life? If human nature is indeed fixed and it is given to us, it is traditioned to us, what is that nature and how is it fulfilled? What do we as Orthodox Christians know about traditioned human nature that we can speak to the secular world that is dying in a false version of humanity. We believe and we confess that Jesus Christ himself is the revelation of the truth of human nature. We are created in his image, created to be conformed in his image, created that his image might be shown forth in us, and in a day and age in which Christ himself has been turned into a cipher for anything anybody wants to imagine, we need to be clear about Jesus. We need to speak the true icon as we have received it. And this is what we have received. In Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. The image that has been made known to us in which the fullness of life is revealed, the fullness of human nature, is the crucified Christ. It's from the cross that Christ announces the completion of the human project. It is finished. What began and was derailed in the garden is completed at Calvary. It is finished, for it is there in self-emptying love, the emptying and pouring out of who we are for the other that we find our true selves. Earlier tonight, I said that there's no Christian ethic that's not a suffering ethic. It's in speaking to the depths of human suffering that the church finds its most authentic voice. It's the voice of the martyrs that deepest and greatest treasure of the church's life, and they are happening at a pace to equal any time in Christian history. Before our eyes, occasionally on television, our greatest treasure. For though the modern project of secularism has taken, has taken place in a headlong rush to eliminate human suffering, it has tragically been the cause of perhaps the greatest suffering the world has ever known. The Bolsheviks imagined they were creating a better world. In their first 10 years, although they later had to back away from it, even sought to remove it from the records of their history, they utterly denied the nature of the human family and initiated a period of sexual revolution that had never been known in the world and has only lately been demanding a return. The earliest days of the party, each male member of the party was entitled to three women. It was considered bourgeois for a woman to turn him down. Oh, they were liberated, you know, unless you're a woman, you know, just one more way. It only worked for 10 years and the destruction of the family and the rampant social disease actually caused Stalin to shut it down. He got a group of doctors together and they wrote eight commandments. It looked a lot like the ten, but they were all about, you know, no adultery and things. That's Stalin, you know, which means no. I mean, <laughs> but uh, the Soviet Union was the first nation in the world to make abortion legal in 1920. They abolished it between 1936 and 1955, but they continue to have a population crisis even as China is having a population crisis today, brave new worlds don't work. Eventually, they fail. 
But first, they make you very miserable, and they kill a lot of you. It's also been a place where the voice of suffering martyrs in union with the crucified Christ, though, has spoken very loudly. In my own spiritual journey, I stumbled as a college student, like a lot of college students do in a lot of places. Without going into detail, I reached a place of very deep questioning and doubt. I studied, I pondered, I became angry and depressed, and the emptiness of secularized Christianity had nothing to say to me and even mocked the very attraction of Christ himself. But in 1974, as I was a college student, a suffering Christian burst into public view. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was awarded the Nobel Prize in literature. His stories, I had an inquirer the other day said to me, who was Solzhenitsyn? I thought, you know, they know nothing, you know. Gosh, one of the last great Christian heroes. But his stories of the gulag caught my attention, and though the media overlooked his Christianity, forgot to mention, they thought he was just an American. Um, I didn't. Uh, reading his essays, I went and got the books that they weren't talking about, his collection of essays from Under the Rubble, beautiful, wonderful collection. But reading him, I found out that he was profoundly Christian and even profoundly orthodox. Reading him set me on a path of hope, for here was an authentic voice. He had been to hell. The Soviet gulags, about as good a version of hell as we've had, maybe Patesh in Romania topped it. He had been to hell and still professed Christ. Indeed, he said his time in the gulag became the very time of his Christian rebirth. He entered the gulag kind of like a Soviet, mouthing all the things, and they just sort of laughed at him and ridiculed him. It was there that he came to faith in Christ, much like Dostoevsky had done the century before when the Tsar sent him to Siberia. I heard authenticity in him, and it rescued my faith. Secular America, the whole of the secular world, is hungry for the authentic word of the cross. And not only the word of the cross, but the authentic life of the cross. It is strangely the constant outcome of modernity's drive to eliminate suffering that its efforts always seem to kill someone. If a life seems destined to bring suffering, then better that it should never be born. Kill it. If a life is drawing to a close and seems faced with suffering, then end it. Euthanize it. Kill it. The Dutch have become the first country to legalize assisted suicide, not for those who are dying, but simply for those who want to die. Depression now qualifies. It will not end in Holland. Our adversary is the father of lies, has been a murderer from the beginning. His answer is always, kill it. Indeed, such state-sponsored suicide stands as a monument to the emptiness and the futility of the entire modern project. I was so brokenhearted in 1989 when the Soviet Union fell, not because of that, but something that was revealed. And what was revealed suddenly was the emptiness of the West. I had a Russian who, in the early 90s, I was talking with him and he said, you know, this fell and it's like, you know, the Berlin Wall has come down, it's, we're free, you know, we're free. And what does America have? Walmart. You went through this for Walmart? It's no wonder they're turning to orthodoxy. There was nothing in the West worth 70 years of that. They may not get it all right right now. I mean, the internal politics of Russia is its own thing, but they know this is not it. This is not it. And many of us know it's not it. We just don't know that there is another it. And here the church must speak and speak clearly. Here we need to speak the life-giving word of the cross, and we can only speak the authentic word if we ourselves go to the cross. The first act of self-emptying is repentance, and the last act of self-emptying is repentance. We will not fix the world. This is, a, this, is, this is the American question comes up. We got a problem, 
What do we do? What do we do? What's the plan, Father? What would you suggest we do? Repent. Become a human being. Live. People around you would like to see what that looks like. Many of them have never seen one. You know? My father was a human being. He became Orthodox at age 79. It was easy for him. He just stepped right into it. Age 79. He was an auto mechanic. That man never told me a story of how he had gotten the better of another man. He just did what he was supposed to do. He worked his jobs. He didn't make a very good living because he was an honest mechanic. And uh, he was an amazing man. My grandfather before him was a mechanic. He became Orthodox. His first Lent, he called me up. He was a simple southern country man. He called me up and said, Son, they brought the cross out this Sunday. I said, Yep. He said, Well, I wanted to get down. He said, They had to get me back up. <laughs> <laughs> it was so natural to him. It made complete sense to him. But his life, his life, had been a human life. You lay down your life. You know? You lay down your life for your family, your kids. He wasn't thinking, how do I build a better world? You know, and kids ask me, what do you think I should be when I grow up? And I say, a good person. What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't care what you do for a living, just be a good person. A really good person. A person of the cross. With kindness and gentleness, we must help one another and the world around us to take the small steps of embracing the cross. To save your life, you must lose it. I mentioned that I volunteer every week at a, it's a real dime store operation of a drug and alcohol treatment program, shoestring operation. Most of the people there have been court ordered. It's one of the reasons why I volunteer. In the end times, the uh, Lord said there'd be a falling away. Yep. A, a massive falling away. <clears throat> And that's what it seems like what's going on. The secular humanism thing is creating not only a, say from the liberal point of human society, a falling away, but even among those who call themselves Christians, there's a falling away. And if they're falling into that secular ideal, yeah. is it part of the end? I, I have absolutely no idea. Um, Archbishop Demetrius mentioned this yesterday and, uh, you know, talked about the difficulty of times. I mean, I, I have written myself, uh, borrowing a line from uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, about uh, the, the long defeat. The, the Christian story is a Pascha, and at its climax, it's crucified. We follow the path of Jesus. I don't know if it's that path, if it's the last path or not. It might rhyme with it. But in a sense, every Christian life rhymes with it. You know, I mean, this, I mean my first concern is that I need to repent. Um, I, you know, I, I fall. I fall away. And, you know, the secular, it's, a, it's you know, most of the people that are out there caught in this stuff. It's not their fault. It's kind of, it's just what they've grown up in. It's what they are. As I say, Americans are born secularists. It's just who we are. Um, we have to preach the gospel to them. The gospel's been preached to me. I know who Solzhenitsyn is. I know what a Christian life looks like. I've met a couple of living saints. And yet Jesus said also in the end times, even his elect would be fooled. Yep, yep. You are part of his elect. We are part of his elect as Christians. Yep. And he, he firmly said that. Even my, and that scares me. Yep. And I constantly try to remind myself, I'm one of his elect. I've got to look around. I've got to stay sharp. I've got to watch the world. I've got to watch what's going on. I, Any minute, something's yep. going to come flying out at me that's going to test me. I, I don't know if we gain anything particularly about knowing what time it is. Um, I, I, what I need to do every day, uh, my path is pretty clear no matter what time it is, whether it's the last days or, or not. Uh, and frankly, I'm, I'll be 62. I'm in my last days. I'm 66. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean. Yeah, you're ahead of me. Okay, go there and prepare a place for me. I'll be with you soon. But uh, yeah. Brother, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, I'm from a secular background myself, and your work, especially, had a tremendous influence on me coming to the church and coming here to the school. So Glory to God. I really want to thank you and thank God for that. Glory to God. Uh, and I really wanted to ask you about. You opened with discussing. Father Alexander Schmemann's take on secularism. Yep. And I, I studied him quite a bit in my undergraduate studies. Yep. 
seems to give this impression, uh, this understanding that secularism is not so much a lack of religion, but a pushing religion aside to a safe corner. Um, and we've talked a lot in this conference about that being a problem outside. We talked a little bit about it being an issue inside. Yep. <coughs> Might you expand a little bit more on the, the issue of pushing religion in, or pushing Christ to well, you know, inside? In my book, The, the uh, Christianity in a One Story Universe, is just a way to try to talk about, actually, it's, it's really just a riff on Schmemann. And it's like how to live a world. I, one of the things I've observed is and just sort of looking at orthodoxy from a modern point of view is that when you really encounter uh, one story living, sacramental living, to someone from the modern world, the first impression will be is it will strike you as superstitious. You know, uh, there's a video of a huge procession in Russia that's kind of gotten popular again. And it's like 90 kilometers they go, and there's an icon of St. Nicholas, and it's all wonderful like that. And uh, anyway, they get there, and there's a tree the icon was found under, and there was a priest in this video who was yelling at the little old ladies because they're, you know, they're eating the tree. And, uh, you know, they're taking scrapings from the tree and taking it home. And, you know, uh, he's right. It's not the tree. Don't eat the tree. But their instinct is very one-story universe. Your Greek grandmother would eat the tree. You know, it's, it's this is, um, and... I, when, I mean, I've, my parish is like, you know, 75, 80 percent converts. And, and so really trying to work at getting this stuff. Um, we had a Soul Saturday last Saturday, you know, and it was pretty thinly attended. Romanians come. Romanians love Soul Saturdays. You know, they really seriously, they make some fantastic kolava and decorate it. It's really great. They take this stuff seriously. Uh, I get calls, I had a call a few years ago and a Romanian woman who was upset because the Greek priest had buried her dad and her aunt said he was going to hell because the priest left out some stuff. I said, tell me what he did. She told me, I said, ah, would, does he bury his own dad like that? That's a Greek funeral. And someone had told her to call me because I did the Romanian stuff. It just is because I'll do anything you ask me. And, uh, you know, and so we went back out of the grave and we did a lot of think folk customs at the grave and, I, you know, the priest, the Romanian priest I called and talked to to get advice on this said, and put it as deep in the grave as you can. And I thought, no, dude, I'm not digging. This is not going to shovels, you know, <laughs> absolutely not. But I didn't tell them the priest had mentioned going deep. So, but it and, 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 they, and I used it as a teaching opportunity to talk about that is a good God and he loves mankind. And the fact that you didn't pour wine on your father's coffin and call the on the coffin, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't mean he's going to hell. God's a good God. He doesn't do that. But that's a very, very one-story worldview. They actually think the world is sacramental. You know, a Father John Parker is here. Uh, a few years ago, he was telling me he had the visit of a Russian priest when those Russian, that tall ship that came into Charleston Harbor, and he was telling me he was in the service, they were doing a mulyebin down, you know, in the chapel, and he was sprinkling, you know, water afterwards, the way, you know, just sprinkling water, and the Russian priest says, Nyet! and grabs the thing and goes, swoosh, swoosh. I told Father John, I said, that's because Americans sprinkle water like they're getting wet, he sprinkles water like you're getting blessed. <laughs> it's a big difference. Big difference. You know, and, and it, you know, it's funny because, I mean, I do, we bless travelers every week at church, and I'd sprinkle like an American. And sometimes I just think, I'm going to go get that big old horsehair job and just give them a Russian blessing, you know, <laughs> and just slosh them good, you know. I mean, come out, I mean, if a Russian's going to get blessed, he wants to drip. You know, just be, he wants, you know, he wants to remember it some hours later. And, but, yeah, you know, but you know, it, it, we're, we're, we're about something else. The water doesn't mean a blessing to us. It makes us think of a blessing. Uh, one of my Russian friends in, in the church, he, the Russians, they come to icons. I don't know, Greeks come to icons like this. You know, it's like a little thing. And St. John Chrysostom accused his congregation of swatting flies, you know. But the Russians come and they stand very still in front of the icon, just, just looking. 
and then they cross themselves really big and slow. And I, I see this like someone I haven't seen. I think, there's a Russian. They've showed up. But I asked him, I said, what do you see? He said, you Americans, when you look at an icon, you see an icon. When I look at an icon, I see God. And, you know, that's really, that's a real sea change to make. Um, when I'm standing in the altar, it's really hard as a secular man to believe that this is the body and blood of Christ. Now, if we're honest in telling each other, we hold that like a thought, but I don't hold that. I don't, I don't hold that like I want to hold that because something has robbed me of my connection with bread and wine. I tell people, look, you are material. You don't have a thought that doesn't have a chemical and electric uh, component to it. You are a material being. You're no angel. You're a material being. I'm made of the same stuff as the bread and wine. Why should I have difficulty believing it becomes God, that it gives himself to me? Instead, we, this, this modern secular Protestant thought has imagined that spiritual equals mental equals something like, I don't know, some force or something out there. It's not. It's not. We, we, we use thought. Modern man is separated from his world. He can't see his world. He can't taste his world. You know, so see it, taste it, touch it. Uh, we work at that. I would really hammer it and preach it and, and try to work on it because, and try to work on me, how to get there more and more. Uh, I tell people, cross yourself. If it feels embarrassing, for God's sakes, do it. You know, that really needs to be that. If you're out in, you're out in a restaurant, absolutely cross yourself. Offend your neighbors. <laughs> you know, I'm wearing a dress, for heaven's sakes, cross yourself. It's the least you can do. I mean, I mean, we have got to start offending people, not to be mean, but in a sense of blessing them at Target or something. I mean, we don't be ashamed of this. Be a Christian, because it's not like I'm trying to put my religion in your face. I'm trying to be a human being, and you're not. And I'm not going to apologize for my wife nursing. I'm not going to apologize for being a human being and believing in a God who sends us pictures where icons weep upside down. Uh, I, I'm so upset that I, don't, I, that I have to fly out before the icon gets here tomorrow. I, my wife and I have wanted to see this icon for a year or so, and she was so excited. Somebody called me, and I couldn't go to see it. But y'all absolutely do it. That, she, is an absolute eloquent statement of the church to the secular world. And I won't be surprised if she doesn't multiply in such examples. Is one of my Russian friends monk over at St. Tikhon's told me, he said, you Americans, you talk about miracles like you don't believe in God. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, glory to God. Um, glory to God. Miracles and all. It's good? Any other final question? Um, I just had a quick question, Father, but I want to preface it by saying my question is based off of a little I've seen in my 23 years of life. I don't want my age to be mistaken for ignorance. Mm. But we, you spoke earlier about uh, choice and uh, people choose religion or don't choose religion, think they're forced to choose religion. But what, what I've seen, people my age and older, they enjoy this perception of choice. Yep. And when they take that to religion, it becomes something dangerous. From what I've seen, yep. they, they, when, they, when they make a decision, when it goes well, they thank themselves. When it goes wrong, they blame God. Yep. And God is now becoming this individual, or this, to them it's an individual, that's, yep. that's it, who is, who is someone to blame. Yep. So my question is, how have you, have you run into that? And if so, how, how does one handle that? Well, I, I, it, I, I do think some of it has to do with age. Uh, I could not have thought these things when I was in my 20s. Which is, they say that you don't really start doing theology until you're about 60. And, uh, and there's some reasons for that. Mathematicians do that in their 20s. But choices, um, when you're young, it all looks like a lot of choices in front of you. you know? But it's, you know, it's not such a big deal. 
Uh, I got married at about age 21, and I haven't made any choices since, but no. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had to. But, um, yeah, but you know, I do tell, I tell young people, don't be, don't, don't, don't be, don't think you're so powerful, you know. But the other thing that I actually have done some things with is, I, I mean, and part of what I'm doing with this is sort of deconstructing secularism. Like, like, take it into its components and see what it's really made of, what's the stuff behind it. The same is true about choice. In some ways, the choices you get in your 20s oh God, are about an economic system that wants you to take responsibility for the fact that you can't get a job because you chose the wrong major and, and that they don't have any responsibility for having trained you and done an economy that half, halfway employed people. You know? And uh, I mean, there's, there's certain things in America we celebrate as freedom. The dark side is freedom only works for those who win the lottery of choice. Um, and worse than that, when the church um, can underwrite that so much in a false theology of vocation that we in fact have to blame God or make God responsible for the American economy and me finding my little place in it. So one of the things I tell people is, look, you know, don't think so, I mean, what do you want to be when you grow up? Do you want to be wealthy? You know, maybe one of the greatest dangers to Greek orthodoxy in America is that they're so darn successful. You're rich. When the scriptures warned you, you've turned your children into those who have to get through the eye of a needle. And they're not sowing orthodoxy. You know, I mean, but who would want to, in America, make their children be poor? You know, we wouldn't want to do that. And yet we see the effects it has in our lives. This is all real. It's just gospel. Jesus said it. And then he said, will you find faith when he comes? But, you know, so, so you do your best, get a job, work hard, go to church, learn to live, become a human being, get married, have lots of babies. Then you'll have all the choices will be done. And, uh, you know, I tell people I'm not a monk, but I obey my bishop, I obey my council, I obey my wife, and it's pretty much easy from there on out. Um, I got a publisher I try to obey now. But um, the, it's, um, I, I mean, seriously. But, I mean, the thing, too, of it is, is, and I didn't belabor it a lot, but this understanding of Eucharistic living, that it is a gift, it is a given, and that to, with every step, with every breath I take, I give thanks to God. I give thanks to God. Every, and everything I give thanks for is communion with God, and that is life. That's the meaning of life, you know. My father, he lived a life. He communed with God, and that's a good life. That's a very good life. God honored him by making him orthodox at age 79 so that it could shine in the glory of the church at his death. But, you know, my mother, she died like a saint, which is another story. But, you, you know, you live and live Eucharistically. Give thanks for all things. And if you're going to make a lot of wrong choices, if you're living Eucharistically, it doesn't matter. You know, I've made a lot of wrong choices and here I am. God is so good. He is so good. The story of Pascha is the story of what God did to rescue a world of wrong choices, you know, and that it all ends up in Pascha, and so it's, it's all good. It's all good. I give thanks to God for all things. Do your best. Love God. Love others. Forgive. Don't kill anybody, and, uh, you know, and, and then I usually write and say, and give lots of stuff away, you know. The poor are God's gift to the rich, and the rich are God's gift to the poor, according to St. John Chrysostom. Uh, stuff, we get it in the marriage prayer, prosperity only means having enough to share. And so, if you have enough to share, then share it. Quit being an idolater. So, anyway, that's, that's it. It's good. Thanks.